So um, good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Wang, an assistant professor of English at the School of Humanities, Nanyang Technological University. Um, so I'd like to first quickly mention that this session is being recorded uh, and also a quick reminder for everyone to ensure that your mics are turned off for the duration of the talk. Uh, we welcome you to join the conversation during the Q&A afterwards. So if you'll just take a quick um, second to have a look at your mic and ensure that it's turned off. You're also welcome to type your question into the chat box during the talk um, and, and you can type it, type it to the group or you can send it to me in a direct message uh, if you prefer. Uh, by default, I will mention who the question is from. So if you prefer not to have your name mentioned, you can also let me know as well. So um, thank you for joining us at this morning's talk, which is the first in the series of NTU English online research seminars for this upcoming semester. So please stay tuned to our events page on the NTU English website for the next three upcoming talks that are happening in the month of March. So the title of our talk today is Local, no uh, Local Fictionality in Nonfiction Narrative, Tobias Wolves in Pharaoh's Army, it's an honor and my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, professor James Phelan is Distinguished University Professor and Arts and Humanities Distinguished Professor in the Department of English at The Ohio State University. He is Director of Medical Humanities, as well as co-founder and current director of Project Narrative at OSU, which is internationally recognized as the major center for narrative research in the world. Professor Phelan co-edits the Theory and Interpretation of Narrative book series at OSU Press, and since 1992, he has been editor of the, acad uh, editor of the academic journal, Narrative. His tireless devotion over the past three decades has made Narrative one of the key journals in literary studies today. It was recently ranked the top journal in the category of literature and writing by Google Scholar. Professor Phelan's scholarship has further been enormously influential He's the author of more than 175 journal articles and numerous important book monographs, including Reading People, Reading Plots, published by the University of Chicago Press, Living to Tell About It, published by Cornell University Press in 2005. Um, this book subsequently won the Perkins Prize for Best Book in Narrative Studies, and more recently, Somebody Telling Somebody Else, as well as Experiencing Fiction with the Ohio State University Press. Um, this, of course, is a book that will be familiar to our English graduate students from the history of literary theory. Professor Phelan was recently announced as the winner of the 2021 Wayne C. Booth Lifetime Achievement Award for his outstanding contributions to narrative studies over the course of his career. In the announcement, the awards committee noted that Professor Phelan is, I quote, the soul of the International Society for the Study of Narrative. In his work with ISSN, he has been a key player in maintaining and developing the international network of narrative scholars. His work in narrative theory has not only been field shaping, but of incomparable pedagogical value. Additionally, he's a devoted mentor to junior narrative scholars, including those in interdisciplinary narratological arenas around the world, which is something I can personally attest to. So on behalf of NTU English, our warm congratulations on this well-deserved honor, Jim. Uh, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to be your student for the past 10 years, and I'm thrilled to be in your virtual classroom again today. So please join me in welcoming Professor James Phelan. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle. Um, and I just wanna say it was, you know, one of the rewards of a job like mine is that I get to work with students like you, and uh, you know it keeps me going. So it's it's been it's been a pleasure, and it's it's wonderful to be uh, invited to, to give this talk and to um, you know see you a little bit uh, on your home court um, in your new environment. Um, so uh, let me get started. Um, make sure I can my slides, let's see. All right, so I'm stuck on, I need to, yeah. I think this is, let me see if this is right. Yeah, all right, well, uh, can you all see that now? Yes, Jim. Um, so I think uh, if you begin the uh, slideshow, it will become slightly larger. 
Yeah, okay, let's try that. Yeah, let me see. Um, what, what I wasn't able to do, okay, there we go. Okay, yeah, good. It, it would seem to be frozen before, anyway. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the sort of the process of, of, of uh, inquiry in this talk, as well as conducting the inquiry. So uh, just to frame it, I'd say that this is a example of what Peter Rabinowitz, uh, my frequent collaborator and I um, coined as a, a methodology uh, known as theory practice. Uh, and basically the idea is that theoretical inquiries and interpretive inquiries are mutually reinforcing. Um, and one of the consequences of that is the, the outcomes um, presumably will have implications for both uh, theory and interpretation. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do. And I will just sort of set it up a little bit. So I'm a fan of Tobias Wolff. Um, I think he's really a remarkable writer, both of fiction and uh, nonfiction. Um, and in the course of reading his, this memoir in Pharaoh's Army, um, I became uh, fascinated with, the, with some, some things that he was doing, right? So just a little bit of background. Um, in Pharaoh's Army is this memoir about Wolf's experiences as a United States soldier during the uh, Vietnam conflict. And he writes it 25 years after the events, and he's writing it for a general audience. Uh, the memoir has chapters devoted to specific episodes or general issues, but all of them are connected by Wolf's being author, narrator, and protagonist in each chapter, and it roughly follows the temporal arc of his experience. Okay, so that's just sort of basic background. So one of the chapters is called um, Old China, and it has this kind of amazing ending, which got my interest. Um, so again, a little more context. In, in this chapter, Wolf is telling the story of his relationship with a man named Pete Landon, who's an older, more accomplished, more at home in the world man whom Wolf looks up to. He regards him as a kind of mentor. And Pete comes to visit him uh, at where he's stationed in Vietnam and decides that um, Wolf has it too easy. And so he pulls some strings to get Wolf reassigned to the front, to the front line, right? And he tells him it's for your own good. Um, the order doesn't go through because uh, Wolf is almost at the end of his tour of duty. Um, but so as, as Pete leaves um, his visit, right? He's left behind some precious china. And so then he wires Wolf and says, oh, can you send it after him? Be sure to put extra padding on the package. And at the end of the instructions, Pete says, uh, do not delay. So this is what we get in the, the last two paragraphs. Wolf writes, I put the package on the floor and pressed at it with my stocking foot for better control and so as not to leave any boot prints. It was tougher than I expected, but of course it was tough. How else could it have lasted all these years? It gave it more and more of my weight, and I was almost standing on it. Though I didn't hear the break, I felt it travel up my leg, a sudden, sad release. I picked up the package and checked to make sure I had broken just the wooden base. It was the ball. It had cracked in several pieces. I wrapped the package in some sheets of stars and stripes and covered those with some parcel paper. Then I took it to the airstrip. I followed Pete's orders to the letter and I did not delay. So then we get some white space and we get this last paragraph. Really now, is the part about the ball true? Did I do that? No, never. I would never, never deliberately take something precious from a man. The pride of his collection say, or his own pride and put it under my foot like that and twist my foot on it and break it? No, not even for his own good. So then the chapter ends there. So I'm thinking, what do I do with this? How do, I, how do we make sense of this? 
how do we relate these two uh, paragraphs to each other and as and as an ending? Um, so you know, th this leads me to think about, well, what are some of the theoretical resources that I can use for this? And I turn to fictionality theory. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is a fictionality approached through the lens of rhetoric. And it has its roots in a book by Richard Walsh called The Rhetoric of Fictionality from 2007. And in 2015, Richard Walsh, Henry Skull Nielsen and I wrote a, an essay called 10 Theses About Fictionality. Um, and we're trying to think about fictionality rhetorically. So uh, this thinking is related to a rhetorical definition of narrative that I've been working with for many years, which is somebody telling somebody else on some occasion and for some purposes that something happened. So with fictionality, the related idea is somebody telling somebody else by means of a non-deceptive departure, um, I'm missing this, um, by means of a non-deceptive departure from a direct concern with actual states of affairs uh, in order to indirectly intervene in those affairs. So this is some of the basics of it. Um, let me say a little bit more about it. Um, so if, if that's the way we're gonna think about fictionality, how are we gonna think about non-fictionality? Um, so discourse designed to report, interpret, evaluate, or otherwise directly intervene in actual states of affairs. Okay, so, so we have these two basic modes, fictionality, non-fictionality, direct intervention, indirect intervention. Fictionality, including a kind of departure from the actual. So what are some other departures, right? They're not all, all, not all the same. So a lie, right? When we lie, we are departing from the actual, but it's a deceptive departure. We don't want the lie to be discovered typically, right? Or a mistake, right? We're, we're, we're trying to report something accurately, but we get it wrong, right? So we are departing from the actual, but we're not intending to, right? Fictionality is distinct in these, this group of departures because it's, not, it's um, intended to be recognized uh, as a departure, um, and it's not claiming to be accurate, right? Um, so, so what are some of the consequences of this way of conceiving of fictionality? So again, it's um, indirection rather than escape, right? So previous um, influential ideas about fictionality kind of set up uh, a strong binary between non-fictionality and fictionality. And it's a kind of an ontological um, distinction, right? So fictionality uh, is concerned with the imagined, non-fictionality is concerned with um, the actual, right? So what we're saying is, yeah, I mean, we don't disagree that there's a distinction, but we say um, they, they're different means to the same end. So the ontological way of talking about it typically tries to sort of goes into this whole idea of fiction and possible worlds and you know fiction as radically different from nonfiction. Right? We're, we're trying to reduce that radical difference by saying the ends are similar. Fictionality and non-fictionality are interested in intervening in the actual world. Um, they just do it by different means. So Another consequence is that this, this idea of fictionality is a broad one, right? It includes um, you know, making hypotheses uh, and so on. And I'm gonna talk about some of the questions about the limits of, or, or everything that's contained within this conception. But for now, what I wanna say is that this conception makes generic fiction, you know, the novel, the short story, the fiction film, um, a subset of this larger class of discourse called fictionality. That in turn opens up attention to border crossings uh, between fictionality and non-fictionality. So uses of fictionality within 
nonfiction and vice versa, uses of uh, non-fictionality within fiction, right? So you think about historical fiction, there's lots of non-fictionality in historical fiction um, and so on, right? And then the other thing is, you know, we, there's also the option a, a, a writer or a speaker can choose to try to, you know, operate in a discourse in which it's deliberately um, not clear whether it's making claims for fictionality or non-fictionality or just where the borderlines uh, uh, reside. And if you think about autofiction, that's a lot of, it seems to me what's going on with that genre. So that's one aspect of, of theory that I, I want, I've turned to to think about the, how am I gonna interpret uh, and get further insight into the ending of old China. So here's another, um, the idea of a narrative as having mimetic, thematic, and synthetic components. Uh, I originally sort of developed this in relationship to character um, in that book, Reading People, Reading Plots, that Michelle you know, had the cover photo up uh, at the beginning. Um, and over time, I realized that it, it, you could expand it. it. It applied beyond character to sort of um, aspects of, of narrative construction and also aspects of readerly interest. So just briefly, the mimetic component um, refers to um, the narrative's interest and imitations of or references to the actual world, including such matters as characters functioning as possible or actual people. So I wanna say that the mimetic works both for fiction and nonfiction, um, but it works in different ways uh, slightly. So, you know, possible people in fiction, actual people in nonfiction. Um, the thematic component refers to the ideational, ethical, and ideological dimensions of the narrative. And the synthetic component refers to the narrative as a constructed object, something artificial rather than natural, something fashioned rather than found. And the larger point here is that these three components exist simultaneously. Um, Now, within this sort of development of this concept of fictionality as rhetoric, um, some questions come up and some resistance has been uh, offered to Richard and Henrik and I as we try to develop it. Um, so one question, one, one objection is that, well, we're trying to claim for the realm of fictionality things that um, aren't actually fictional, uh, right? So, in the 10 Theses essay, we talk about Barack Obama um, inventing this concept of Romnesia to talk about Mitt Romney's misrepresentation of uh, Barack Obama's record, right? And he said, so Romney in the, in the, in the campaign um, in 2012 says, okay, Barack did, did this, right, or stood for this, and he, he actually didn't, right? So Obama says, well, I think he's suffering from amnesia, uh, and he's playing on the idea of amnesia, right? And so we use this as an example of uh, fictionality, and people are saying, well, wait, that's not fictionality, that's just a pun, right? So one of the other things that we got accused of claiming too much for are things like, um, you know, the response to the terrible assassination of the uh, artist involved with uh, the, the French magazine that was um, publishing images of uh, Muhammad, right? And so to, to um, express solidarity, people started saying, uh, Je suis Charlie Hebdo, right? And we said, oh, that's another really interesting uh, int instance of fictionality. Again, people said, no, wait, that's just a metaphor about identity. Um, so these kinds of objections raise these kinds of questions, right? So does fictionality require narrative, right? So Romnesia, that's not a narrative. Just we Charlie Hebdo, that's not a narrative. Um, we, we, we need to think about fictionality as tied to narrative. That's the objection, right? And then the other sort of related question is, are figures such as metaphors instances of fictionality? Or are they just, you know, figures of speech? So where's the line between figures and fictionality? 
Um, another question is, uh, does fictionality need to be signaled? Are there signposts uh, of fictionality? Uh, and then always a question worth asking is, what's the value added of this uh, concept and this approach? Does it add value? And in, for, for us today, I'll say, does it add value to the task of interpretation? So that's something I wanna try to get to. All right, so in order to address these things, um, it seemed to me that it might be helpful to take some examples from graphic memoir um, and, and do some theorize, theorization there before we go back to the print memoir of Wolf's uh, in Pharaoh's Army. So one reason why I want to turn to the graphic memoir is because they're global nonfictions. Everybody tends to agree with that. They also use visual fictionality. Um, they sometimes use verbal fictionality, but the, the visual fictionality is pretty clear and people don't dispute it. Um, but it also then raises an, another sort of related question. Does the visual track in a graphic memoir always contain some element of fictionality? Um, because you know there's, there's drawing here and it's clearly not uh, always that photographically uh, realistic. Uh, so is it, should we say, talk about it as uh, incorporating elements of fictionality? All right, so I'm gonna show a few slides from uh, these two graphic memoirs, uh, Cancer Vixen by Marissa Acacella Marchetto, and then um, Can't We Talk About Something More Pleasant by Roz Chast. So here we go. So this is from Cancer Vixen. All right, so we'll look at, look a little bit at the verbal track as well. Um, the doctor is speaking, uh, the oncologist uh, saying, we need to see if the cells are angry. Uh, we can't know if there's an abnormality until we look at them under a microscope. So that's happening on the verbal track. And then Marchetto, right, gives us the drawing of, you know, uh, taking the cells from the breast and then <laughs> her image of the angry cells. Okay, well, that's what we'll focus on uh, as we go forward. So there they are with their middle fingers extended, uh, tongues out, red tongues, and so on. Okay, angry cells. All right, so now here's an example from, um, can't we talk about something more pleasant, right? Um, this is a, a drawing and, and textual commentary by Raj Chast about her father, um, who's aging and uh, you know moving toward the end of life. So she's describing him more important. He was kind and sensitive. He knew that my mother had a terrible temper and that she could be overpowering. Uh, she had a thick skin. He, like me, did not. She often accused my father of walking around with his feelers out. And that's, we, we get the, the visual image of that, right? So it's just looking at these, let's, let's, I want to make some initial hypotheses. So what we get with the visuals are these renditions of verbal metaphors um, and they're clear instances of fictionality. So the angry cells, right? And feelers out. I don't think anybody would say, oh, that Chast and uh, Marchetto are trying to represent uh, actual states, right? So, if, if those are instances of clear instances of fictionality, they suggest the potential fictionality of other metaphors, such as Je suis Charlie Hebdo, right? Um, they also suggest that narrative is uh, not necessary for fictionality, right? We can think about it in relationship to portraiture as we are with uh, Chas' re representation of her father or with uh, conceptuality, like you know, the concept of romnesia, right? Or I would say lyricality, where we're just sort of exploring a, a particular feeling or state. Um, but the other thing I wanna suggest, and it goes, goes back to this, the, um, this image, right? Is that the status, what, fictional or non-fictional status, it really has, is connected to 
the speaker, or the drawer, right? The redder, R H E T O R, and their speech act, right? So for the oncologist, we would need to see if the cells are angry. That for him, it may very well be a dead metaphor. He's not trying to um, speak fictionally, right? Um, whereas for Marchetto and, and her representation of it, um, angry cells, there's this fictionality. Okay, so some, again, preliminary uh, theoretical conclusions. If that last point is persuasive, then we can say it's not ultimately about the text, right? So angry cells could be either an instance of fictionality uh, or an instance of non-fictionality. Um, it depends on the usage. All right, so what is it about? It's about someone using the resources uh, of a discursive medium as part of a non-deceptive, uh, non-erroneous departure from direct engagement uh, with the actual in order to influence a specific audience in some ways rather than others. So in, in other words, it's ultimately about the rhetor, the occasion, the audience, and the purpose, right? Um, also, I'm just going to put this out there. I, I'm not deducing it from the images, um, but to say that signposts are common, but they're not necessary, right? If we're thinking about red or occasion audience and purpose, and we're moving away from the text as the determination of the status, then we don't need uh, a textual signal, right? And so just to give an illustration, if we think about deadpan comments, right? Um, are they serious or ironic, right? You can't tell from the text, right? But you may be able to tell from your knowledge, right? So if, if I'm famous for my deadpan, but I'm not always gonna be deadpan, when I talk to Michelle, she may be recognizing that I am using deadpan, not because of what I say, the, the sort of the utterance itself, the textual features, but rather her knowledge of me. All right, this, is, this is not a major point for now, but it'll be important when we um, come back to Wolf. Okay. So, so there's some preliminary conclusions. Um, however, those conclusions raise, there's some additional, so turning to the, to the visual helps us, but it also raises some additional questions. So one of them, does an holographic representation involve some degree of fictionality? So, you know, perhaps we should talk about hybrid fictionality. Um, we have, for example, if you look at those images in uh, Can't We Talk, uh, Chast is a, her visual style is caricature. Um, in Cancer Vixen, it's not so much um, caricature, but it's clearly uh, highly stylized. So is there some element of fictionality there? Um, my first response is to say, uh, there's, there's a little bit of a confusion in that question or in that objection, right, because all representation is a matter of construction. It's all synthetic and construction is different from invention, okay? So that means the synthetic is not equivalent to the fictional. Let me try to explain by looking at chest again. Let me look quickly at, at these images. Um, so the words we both dreaded were, I'm gonna blow my top. This is what she called a blast from chest. This is what her, her mother called, right? Uh, so here's another case where um, she's using the Edvard Munch uh, painting of the scream, sort of imposing herself uh, on that um, and, and to express her reaction to this news that um, her mother and father had been taken to the emergency room. Okay. And then here's another one where we have uh, an image of the Grim Reaper sitting in her parents' uh, living room. So, come at these through two theses uh, that we develop in the 10 theses uh, 
about fictionality. So thesis two is even as fictive discourse is a clear alternative to non-fictive discourse, the two are closely interrelated in continuous exchange. And so are the ways in which we engage with them. And thesis eight, fictionality often provides a double exposure of imagined and real. So I wanna say we can apply those to these images. So with the um, blast from chest, the, the, that huge fictionalization of the size of the mother, um, there is a fictional representation of the mother uh, and its fictionality um, is determined in part in exchange with the standard image where she's, you know, normal size, right? Um, so we were, my point is that Chast sort of, in this case, does signal the fictionality by the departure from the standard, which is, I want to say, nonfiction. Um, and then with the image of the, uh, her representing herself as the woman in the screen, that's an, an instance of double exposure. Chest and the woman, or chest as the woman, and um, and I think there's an interesting contrast between that image and the, that of the Grim, Grim Reaper, where we have a single uh, fictional exposure, right? So I'm just trying to get at the difference between the, the scream image and that of um, the Grim Reaper, right? Double exposure as opposed to single exposure. Um, both of them are fictional, but with the, the double exposure, we have a fictional a fictionality and non-fictionality in this you know, sort of simultaneous exchange. Okay, so what I want to say is that what happens with with the visual then is that chess car caricatures foreground the synthetic, right? But that's not the same as using hybrid fictionality, um, and that I think paying attention to continuous exchange and double exposure better explains uh, the effect of this as we read um, than, than um, saying um, that it's hybrid fictionality. Um, then the other thing is to say that in these genres, right, where there's global non-fictionality so that the visual style, right, comes to be the, the, the sort of the base visual style comes to be the way that the non-fictional is being communicated. Um, so again, construction does not equal invention. All right, so this then sets up another kind of series of, of uh, relationships, I think. We can think about verbal style and visual style. Right, so um, let's think about an analogy between the visual style of images um, and the visual style of the lettering, right? So in each case, right, with, we have the artist drawing the letters, right? And they're, they're doing it in a stylistically characteristic way. Do we wanna call that lettering hybrid fictionality? I want to say you no, know, intuitively we would say no, and I want to extend that to the visual, right? Um, and the, or another way to come at this is to say that visual style in the graphic is like verbal style in print, right? Um, and so, for example, writers like Wolf and Tobias Wolf, Virginia Wolf, others, right, have a similar style in their fiction and nonfiction. So, what determines the status of their writing is not their verbal style, just like I want to say the visual style doesn't determine the status of the drawings, right? Um, so Chast has a similar style in her nonfiction memoir and in her fictional New Yorker cartoons, right? So the fictionality doesn't reside in the uh, text, but rather in the claims that she's making for the representations uh, via the visual uh, images. So again, um, it's not about the text, but about the rhetorical claims. All right, so one other wrinkle here, um, and then we'll get to get back to Wolf. So which is that 
there's a rhetorical model of audiences. Um, it goes like this in narrative. You can think about actual readers, actual audience of flesh and blood readers. We're going to extend it to the graphic, right? The viewers um, or the film uh, viewers. Um, so then there's the authorial audience, which is the target audience uh, of the speaker. Um, the narrative audience, right? And this is the one I want to focus on. So, which is an observer position in the story world. Um, and it's the audience which accounts for the phenomenon of double consciousness as we read fiction, right? So one way to illustrate this is to think about being in a, the audience at a wonderful, powerful performance of Shakespeare's Othello, right? And at the end of act five, Othello is about to strangle Desdemona. And we, if you're in that audience, you're feeling what Aristotle called pity and fear, right? You have very strong affective responses. And you also, you know, you might want to say in one level of consciousness, Othello, don't do that. You're going to regret it, right? You've been duped by Iago. Please don't do it. Don't do it. And so you can feel that very, very strongly, but you also stay in your seat, right? And you don't stop him. And you're not a bad person for doing that, right? For staying in your seat. Well, why? Why, why is that? Well, because you have double consciousness. You're in, in, the, in the narrative audience, as well as in Shakespeare's sort of more general audience where you know that it's a fiction. Right. Okay. So then there's the uh, narrative, which is the audience addressed by the narrator. Um, so what I want to say is that this model is helpful to talk about fictionality and the difference between local fictionality and global fictionality, um, because um, the narrative audience, the presence or absence of the narrative audience is a key or a clue to whether we're dealing with global fictionality or non-fictionality. That is, when we read the narrative, are we um, in a position where our double consciousness is activated or not, right? So you think about, say, Jane Austen's Emma, right? We think about her as possible person and we feel real emotions about her, right? And so we have that at one level of consciousness, while at the same time, we recognize that she's this synthetic character that Austin has invented, right? If you think about that, our readerly response to Emma, as opposed to our readerly response to Marcello's angry self, I think it's fair to say that we only have single consciousness about Marcello's angry self. Um, and so from that, I'm going to extend to say that there's no narrative audience in memoir and no narrative audience in the local fictionality within memoir. Okay, so all that theoretical stuff about fictionality, we'll go back to Wolf, right? So before we get to um, back to old China, I want to take a look at some other things I notice that Wolf does that are remarkable and of interest to thinking about fictionality. So I'll go back to thesis two. Um, even as fictive discourse is a clear alternative to non-fictive discourse, the two are closely interrelated in continuous exchange. Um, and, and so are the ways in which we engage with them. All right. In this chapter on close calls, it seems to me that Wolf is demonstrating the sort of the usefulness of thesis two, in part by pushing it to the breaking point, right? And it's almost like he read the ten theses and then decided to push it to the breaking point, right? Obviously, he didn't. His, his history doesn't work uh, out that way, and so on. But it is. I had this experience, like, oh, wait a minute. He's read this, and then he's trying to tell us that we need to think, think, think harder, think longer about it. So uh, 
And here's some details. So in this chapter, he talks about three close calls. Um, I'm gonna talk about what he does with close call number one and close call number three. So close call, and by close calls, he means you know times when he could have died. He's that close to death. So um, Wolf falls asleep in his Jeep in the middle of the village market, only to be awoken by locals excitedly talking and pointing under the Jeep at a grenade um, with its pin pushed. Uh, Wolf gets out of the out of the Jeep, but stands around gaping at, uh, until his partner, Sergeant Bernay, returns and takes over. Um, and then Wolf um, writes, I looked on. None of it seemed to have anything to do with me. Once the area was cleared, Sergeant Bernay got a couple of skittish villagers to stand watch until we could send someone to take care of the grenade. Then we started to walk back to the battalion. Along the way, I found my legs acting funny. My knees wouldn't lock. I went to lean against the wall. Sergeant Brene put his hand on my arm to steady me. Then something went slack in my belly, and I felt a stream of shit pouring hotly down my, out of my, I can see that on my screen, but down my legs, even into my boots, I put a, my head against the wall and wept for very shame. It's all right, sir, Sergeant Brene said. You'll be all right. Grenade, and then we have a little passage and we get the end of it. The grenade never did go off on its own. Our ordnance disposal boys covered it with sandbags and triggered it with a dose of plastique. It was an army grenade, not some local mad bomber device. The chances of it failing like that were cruelly small, just about non-existent in fact. That was my first close call. Okay, so what I wanna suggest here is that and this is in connection with what I'm, the theoretical stuff I've been saying, that what we have here is an instance of implicit fictionality that Wolf wants us readers, his authorial audience, to pick up on, right? Now there's no explicit fictionality in the narrative discourse. Um, but if we ask, why does Wolf's body react the way it does, right? I wanna suggest that the answer to that is that Wolf, influenced by Hemingway and the whole idea of the iceberg principle um, is using implied fictionality, right? What's happening is that Wolf, the character, the experiencing eye registers the gap between what actually happened, he escaped, and what did not, he could have died, right? And he invites his audience to imagine what almost happened, right? The need should have gone off didn't right and that that registering of that gap is what generates the bodily uh, response so within that then if that makes sense then we could think about how the mimetic thematic and synthetic are working in connection with this implicit fictionality um, so there's this um, interesting relationship between the experiencing eye at the time of the action and the narrating eye at the time of the telling, right? So that the narrating eye at the time of the telling leaves it implicit and we see the reaction in the experiencing eye and that generates a kind of affective force um, in the representation of the whole experience. And that affective force then contributes to a kind of implicit thematizing of close calls, uh, their nature and their significance and how one might respond to them. Uh, synthetic though, I think is, this is all, you know, unobtrusive. It's very artful, but it's unobtrusive. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's implicit is also a, a signal of its uh, unobtrusive quality. Um, so, one of the then theoretical consequences of this uh, effort to interpret what's going on is to generate this revised definition of fictionality. So here, intentionally communicated invention, projection, or other means of directing an audience to imagine or consider 
not actual states or sets of events, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of invention and projection, right? We can expand that. It's not just invention, but invention and projection. We don't need an explicit signal, but basically what's happening is directing the audience to imagine or consider the non-actual. Okay, now we'll go to close call number three. Um, and Wolf does something different yet again. Uh, he moves to something more explicit. Um, so just to set up, Wolf and another soldier, uh, Keith Young, are standing next to each other uh, among a group at headquarters listening to situation reports on the radio. Suddenly a call for help comes in. Uh, as they've been listening, a ranking officer, General Lance, has placed his hand on Keith's shoulder. Thus, when the call for help comes in, General Lance says to him, well, Keith, what do you think? Right. And then here's Wolf's text. Wolf got killed later that afternoon. If General Lance had stood, be had stood between us, it would have been my shoulder the hand fell on. The other hand being occupied with his curved, fragrant, fatherly pipe. It would have been me receiving the father's thoughtless blessing touch, me to whom he turned, me to whom he put the kindly question, what do you think? That had only one answer. So Wolf then, you know, now this is the third, the third close call. And he starts to reflect on what this means. Uh, and he starts to thematize it. Right? And basically what I see happening is that the continuous exchange between the fictional and the non-fictional, as it relates to close calls, leads to a kind of erasure of the mortar. And here's the passage in which, in which I see that happening. So, in a world where the most consequential things happen by chance uh, or from unfathomable, unfathomable reasons, you don't look to reason for help. Um, again, I, I can't read it all on my screen. Um, I, you could sort with magic. You encourage yourself with charms, omens, and propitiation. Without your knowledge, the basic caveman belief in blood sacrifice, one life being sacrificed for another, begins to steal into your bones. How could it not? All around you, people are killed. Soldiers, farmers, teachers, mothers, fathers, nurses, your friends, but not you. They have been killed instead of you. This observation is unavoidable. So in time, Mr. Corollary, implicit in the word instead, in place of. They have been killed in place of you, in your place. It's the close call you have to keep escaping from, the unending doubt that you have the right to your own life. There's a kind of fictionality in this idea that they've been killed instead of you, but it's not a fictionality that you can hang on to. It's a fictionality that becomes a sense of the actual. Right. Okay, so he continues and he goes back to Keith's experience and reflecting on it. He talks about how he knows him and the, the closest he came to him was this time when they both went and bought these cheap suits. And Keith was so enamored of these suits and he thought he was getting such a deal. Um, and Wolf bought some too, but not nearly as many. So uh, he says, uh, that was the first thought I had when I heard that he'd been killed. What about all those clothes? It was a gasp of a thought, completely instinctual, without malice or irony. I sometimes tried to imagine other men wearing Keith's suits but I couldn't bring the images to mind. What I see instead is a dark closet with all his suits hanging in a row. Someone opens the closet door and looks at them for a time and closes the door again. Okay, so 
this is explicit fictionality, right? He's imagining this, right? But if we ask the question, who is the someone opening the door? Well, I think one answer is Wolf, right? Um, who's he imagining opening the door? Himself, right? But also, not only Wolf, it could be a friend or family member, right? Um, but then if we think about the someone else, right? This whole idea of the instead of you is that someone else looking at Wolf's closet, right? And the borders have, have uh, been erased. So, and also we get a shift to the present tense, right? Someone opens the closet door, right? What I see instead is a dark closet with all its suits hanging in a row, right? Present tense, 25 years after, he's still haunted by Keith's death, right? And I think here what we have is the affective power of the mimetic clinching the th thematic point about close calls and the eraser of the border between the fictional and the non-fictional. Okay, so what's going on sort of more generally, you can say, all right, so Wolf the modernist is engaging in a kind of postmodernist ontological questioning um, and is relying on the relation between the mimetic and the thematic uh, to make that powerful for his audience. Um, the explicit fictionality works by implication and inference. Um, and then just to leave this and just throw this out there, I'm not going to develop it. The idea that implicit fictionality maybe is especially suited to the affordances of print. Um, implicit fictionality and the graphic may be harder to, to do. Okay. And come back to old China, right? So here's the ending again, right? The first paragraph, I put the package on the floor, right? And we have the description of crushing it, right? And then we have the white space and the last paragraph. Really now, is that true? Did I do that? I would never, right? Take, you know, the, something precious from a man, the pride of his collection, say, or his own pride, and put it under my foot like that and twist my foot on it and break it. No, not even for his own good. So now here I wanna sort of come back to this question of the value added of the fictionality in relationship to this passage, because um, we have some language you know, to talk about this without resorting to fictionality necessarily, right? So we could talk about denarration, this idea that something is asserted in one paragraph or one sentence, and then it's, you know, undercut in the next one, right? And we might even talk about unreliability here, right? So which report, well, only one report is reliable. Uh, which one, which one actually, you know, is an account of what Wolf actually did. Um, but I wanna suggest uh, and then we can also talk about ambiguity, right? And it's sort of stock and trade with uh, literary narrative, right? But I wanna say that um, the concept of fictionality adds value uh, because it emphasizes the way that the denarration and the unreliability destabilize the relation between the actual slash referential and the invented, right? So which paragraph is the report and which paragraph is the invention, right? There is, a, we have, we know that in the actual, right? Wolf either did or did not crush the ball, right? But in the representation, we don't know because of the way in which he combines the fictionality and the ambiguity, right? So this is a kind of deliberate and determinate ambiguity and when, if you wanted to say, oh, he must have done, he must have crushed it, or, oh, he must have not crushed it, um, you can make a good case. But the fact that you can make a good case for both suggests that it's ambiguous and we, we shouldn't try to decide, right? But so what, do, and, and that depends upon the, the fictionality. So what do we, what do we gain by, by that, right? So determine ambiguity about what's fictional and what's not, if the first paragraph is the report and the second the invention, then Wolf the author is showing how Wolf the character is both getting revenge on Pete and being infected by Pete's exercise of power and control, 
he's taking something valuable from Pete, just as Pete was taking something valuable from him by trying to change his assignment, right? And the fact that it's carried out through this gift um, adds to that uh, whole, both sides of that, right? The revenge and, and the infection, um, all right? And that's, there's certain affective and ethical consequences of that reading, right? How we think about, about Wolf and, um, you know, how we judge him ethically and whether we think he's justified and all those interesting questions, right? On the other hand, if the first paragraph is the invention, then we could say it's a therapeutic fantasy, right? And the second paragraph is a return to the actual, right? In this way, the ending would be conveying his outrage, but also showing him to be ultimately, uh, ultimately to be ethically superior to Pete, right? He's not infected, he still does it, right? He has, he has the therapeutic fantasy of imagining it, but he also stops short of that and he doesn't take this valuable thing away from Pete uh, and he sends it. And so in that sense, uh, he would be ethically superior. Um, and that then you know, has different affective and ethical consequences, right? But the point is that we have to, I think, Wolf was wanting his audience to, to uh, sort of hang on to both possibilities and not try to resolve um, you know, the, 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 not try to say, all right, you got to pick one or the other. You, let's dwell in each, right? Um, so in that sense, I want to say, well, you know, let's think about the value added. The dual possibilities emphasize the significance of the incident for Wolf, right? And this it sort of deepens our mimetic engagement, right? What they both have in common is that it's the end of his relationship with Pete. Um, The other thing that's going on here, I think, with this is that Wolf is taking the particular and contingent details of his everyday experience and shaping them so that they have an ethical, affective, and thematic force that goes beyond the particulars. Right? And this is the challenge of nonfiction uh, memoir narrative. Right? Take, take sort of everyday experience and invest it with this uh, ethical, affective, and thematic force, um, as as I think we can see that he does, you know, so obviously with the close call, so he does the kind of explicit thematizing. Here, I think he's relying a lot on, on giving the force through this uh, amazing kind of ending. Um, and then also, and this is maybe a little bit more speculative, it seems to me that um, there's a kind of thematic analogy opened up in this ending between Pete and Wolf on the one hand and the United States and Vietnam on the other um, with you know, the US being Pete and Wolf being Vietnam. There's this kind of idea of big brother knows best and is acting for your own good, um, but the little brother does still have some room for maneuver. Um, so sort of summing up here, um, Going back to the slide about the questions and the resistance. So uh, does fictionality require uh, narrativity? This, and my answer is no, it's not required, right? You can have fictionality without narrative. Uh, often you have it with narrative or within narrative, right? Um, is fictionality, what's the relationship between fictionality and figurality? Is use of a figure an instance of um, fictionality? Well, it depends, right? Because uh, it's not about the text, it's about the, the uh, speaker's uh, intention and purpose in relationship to an audience. Um, does fictionality need to be signaled? No. Um, are <laughs> Nielsen, Fallon, and Walsh claiming too much for fictionality? No, <laughs> I say. Um, and that there is value added uh, to the understanding of the texture and quality of author audience relations by paying attention to fictionality and sort of the local fictionality uh, in the global nonfiction of uh, in Pharaoh's army. And the larger takeaway, sort of what I want to end with, is that rhetoric uh, trumps formalism. Right? It's not about the text again. It's not. It's about. It's about authors, audiences, uh, occasions, and, and purposes, uh, which kind of determine the text, okay? 
And then finally, I want to say the rhetorical theory of fictionality is always a work in progress. So this is kind of a progress report. And I will end by thanking you for listening and say I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much for the talk, Jim. So I think with that, um, I'm going to say a warm thanks and, and uh, our appreciation, Jim, um, for taking time out of your evening to join us in Singapore this morning. Um, also, a quick thank you to uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Tamara Wagner, uh, Dr. Graham Matthews, and uh, Ms. Cheryl Chung for making the talk possible. And thanks to everyone for making it to the seminar and have a lovely day ahead. So thanks very much, Jim. Thank you all. And thanks for your great questions. And it was a real pleasure. Thanks, Thanks again. Jim.